Welcome everyone to the Space Prize Speaker Series. This is episode 17 on September 29th, 2022. I'm Mark Wagner, the president of Space Prize Foundation. I'll say a few more words about Space Prize as we go forward, but I'm thrilled to once again be joined by our host, Dr. Leslie Anderson, and by our guest, Dr. Jingqi Tai from uh, China. So we expect a totally different uh, uh, side of the commercial space industry perspective this week. Uh, really excited about hearing uh, Jingqi's story, uh, exploring her career trajectory and, and some of her advice for, uh, for young people. Let me say a few words about Space Prize before we, we dive in. Space Prize is a New York-based nonprofit serving uh, young women around the world, working to inspire and empower them to pursue STEAM education, that's science, technology, engineering, the arts, and math, and to explore careers in the growing space industry, the growing and uh, growing uh, international space industry. We do this in two ways. One is through attention grabbing uh, contests with spectacular prizes like uh, parabolic flights uh, where the winners can experience weightlessness. And the other is through producing uh, open education resources like this guest speaker series. So our first contest was in New York City uh, early in this year, 2022. In January, we had an essay contest across the five boroughs followed by a video contest in February. And by March, we had 25 of the finalists experience a simulated mission to Mars at the Challenger Center right there in Manhattan. Uh, we had Yuri's Night celebrations in April for the finalists as well. And in April, we sent five winners to Space Camp's new LIFT uh, leadership program. And in May, we sent five winners that you see pictured here on a parabolic flight on zero G. Thanks to a partnership with uh, Gaze in Space, another nonprofit uh, focused on representation in space. Uh, they got to fly with Star Trek's Denise Crosby, uh, and thanks to our partnership with Zero-G, our executive director, Kim Asharia, uh, on the left here, also got to fly with them. So really a fantastic experience, and they're now partnered with mentors in the space industry, women uh, in influential positions across the industry, uh, for a full year. We just completed a similar contest in Paris. We announced the winners at IAC last week. And uh, again, the, the winners, uh, Salva uh, on the, Dalva, I'm sorry, on the far left, will get to experience a zero G flight there in France and be paired with uh, all of the finalists you see pictured here, paired with mentors uh, in the industry. There's a similar contest going on right now in Portugal that's open to Portuguese women around the world, uh, being conducted in Portuguese for the essays and the videos. Uh, and they also will receive the winners a zero G flight uh, in Europe. So when it comes to the other side of the work, producing open education resources, in addition to this, uh, this guest speaker series, we produced a complete curriculum, could be a uh, elective course at a school, uh, designed to be about 12 weeks long, could be an after school program, could be a homeschool program or a self-paced program. Uh, but there's eight chapters covering not only an introduction to space science and the history of space exploration, uh, but also, kicking off with why space is important to people on Earth, everything from uh, spin-off technologies to uh, monitoring the environment, uh, and then some. Uh, it looks at skill sets and mindsets a kid will need to be successful, whether or not they're gonna be working in space. Uh, and of course, it explores everything that's happening in the new space economy, uh, commercially and internationally, and looks at more philosophical issues like space sustainability, uh, governance and ethics. Uh, and including future implications like uh, escaping existential threats and actually achieving our higher aspirations for shepherding life throughout the solar system and beyond. So it is definitely ambitious. Uh, it is uh, complete, though there's lots of polishing touches we're still working on. So you can access that right now at spaceprize.org slash education. Uh, and you can access the Flexbook uh, at ck12.org where you'll find lots of uh, interactives for each section of the curriculum. Uh, of course, I also have to mention my own book. This is more for a uh, adult audience and students per se, but uh, this is taking a look at how we might best prepare today's students for the growing space economy and for humanity's rapidly approaching multi-planet future. And it looks a couple steps down the road to how might we educate people when we have our first settlements on the moon and on Mars and uh, on deep space settlements. Uh, it also concludes with more philosophical issues like ethics and governance uh, and alternatives moving out into the solar system. 
So when it comes to this speaker series, we have already featured astronauts, engineers, and scientists, but we've also featured entrepreneurs, designers of various kinds, lawyers, historians, uh, and many, many more. We've got uh, geologists and astrophotographers and, and others coming up. Um, Leslie mentioned last episode that we've uh, got the, the scientific head of the James Webb T Space Telescope uh, program coming up. So just some fantastic guests lined up as well. With those of you who are here, we, we appreciate you being here. We hope you will participate. Uh, use the chat liberally. Feel free to raise your hand uh, digitally or physically. We'd love to, uh, to hear from you. Feel free to even interrupt with a group uh, this small. Uh, you, you may even share a screen if you've got something to share when we come to it. And feel free to use the help feature or to uh, message me directly if, uh, if you need anything. Uh, my last note is that we will occasionally leave some wait time to make sure that our guest has said uh, everything she has to say and to make sure that you guys have said everything you have to say and you've asked your follow-up questions. Um, so if there is wait time, uh, that is by design. That in mind, any questions here before we go on? Okay, cool. In that case, I want to go ahead and uh, introduce Dr. Leslie Anderson, our host. She's a science planner with the U.S. Antarctic Program, coordinating scientific expeditions in the deep field. She's a former classroom teacher, a science teacher, uh, and continues to work in the field uh, of education as a consultant. In fact, she helped us write the uh, Space Prize curriculum and manage the team that, that pulled that together. Um, I, I learned today that uh, Leslie was part of the uh, STAR program at uh, NASA, the science teachers and researchers, if I got that right. Uh, and she that's when she uh, was lucky enough to intern at um, uh, JPL and other places over the course of three summers. And she, has, as I, I love to say, she's been to Antarctica and the, and the Arctic, and she's studied sea turtles and uh, sharks and neutrinos in the ice. Uh, we're we're lucky to have her here as well, hosting the uh, hosting the episode. So Leslie, take it away. Let's introduce uh, our guest. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, I'm excited to introduce you guys today to Dr. Jing Shi Chai, was appointed the Vice President of Beijing Interstellar Glory Space Technology Company Limited in 2020. Beijing Interstellar Glory Space Technology is a private aerospace company in China. The company successfully launched suborbital sounding rockets in April 2018 and September 2018, respectively, and launched a two-orbit rocket Hyperbola-1 in July 2019. The successful launch of this two-orbit rocket not only achieved a zero breakthrough in the two-orbit launch mission of China's private aerospace industry, but also made China the world's second country to have a private enterprise that can independently develop and successfully launch a two-orbit rocket. Jing Shi Tai joined Beijing Interstellar in 2017 as a senior engineer. She was promoted to the head of the project management and marketing department in 2018, and was appointed to the head of the general affairs department in 2019. She became general manager assistant in 2020. Prior to joining Beijing Interstellar, Jing Shi worked as in Asia Pacific Space Cooperation Organization as a project manager and China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology Institution as a senior engineer. Jing Shi Tai studied mechanical engineering at Imperial College London and got her PhD in 2011. 10 years of working experience in the space aerospace industry has allowed her to see the potential development of the commercial aerospace industry in China. She believes the space that, that she believes that space cause has no country border. She would like to unite and collaborate with people from various circles of society over the world to promote the development of space exploration. Welcome Jing Shi, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, my first question for you, can you tell us about your work with Beijing Interstellar Glory Space Technology Company Limited? Sure, hello everyone, hello Leslie. Thank you for the introduction. Well, I joined the company in 2017, as you have introduced, as a senior engineer. And I initially worked on the structure design, stage separation design at the very beginning. And uh, then with the development of the company, I was promoted to the lead of the project management department, uh, marketing department, 
um, the then the general affairs department. And currently, I'm the vice president of the company and helping CEO to operate the company. So what I'm doing here is like I hold down the engineering work, like the uh, drawing designs, and I have done the marketing things, and also control the whole process or how to convert um, a drawing paper into a real rocket process. And uh, for what I'm doing it now, it's general best everything <laughs> like related to the company operation, like HR, uh, and. Um, uh, and also uh, things with the people related and also the product related, <laughs> almost everything here. <laughs> so can you tell us a little, you've got a lot of experience, not only with project management and marketing, but engineering as well. How did all of those different backgrounds help you in the role that you have today? Oh, yes. Um, I would say every job that I've done has been of great help and been the foundation of the subsequent performance. Uh, I was first worked as a professional and a technical staff, and it makes me know the product of the company, I mean, the rocket very well, as I designed parts of it. And then the rocket looks quite similar from the outside, but uh, it's totally different from inside, which determines the technical hurdles, carrying capacity, and reliability things. So at the engineering, I do the drawings, but also have to convert the design paper into a real, a real thing. And that's what a project manager do, like what's my second role uh, in the company. And I build the supply chain. I control the cost and freight in the budget and have to put forward the project following the schedule. It's um, kind of a challenge of not knowing much about the aerospace technology, but with the engineering background, things actually can be easier. And uh, especially when negotiating with the both the supply chain side and also with the staff, uh, the technical staff, which I mean, design side, because you know both of them and you can understand them on their point of view. And also after these two roles, like I had started to do the marketing of the company. Uh, with both the engineering and the project management background, it prepared myself well for this post. Um, marketing is important for a private aerospace company, especially in China, because it's a business at all. And uh, there has to be, they have to have profit for the company for sustainable improvement and development. Uh, but as a rocket maker and a launching service provider, you know, you can't sell your rocket by telling our satellite client saying that, well, it's a pretty thing, it's pretty cool, and it's a beautiful rocket. But you have to introduce the carrying, uh, carrying capacity or reliability and the interface parameters with satellites, with say ICD files, and uh, the environmental condition parameters to satellites when the rocket flying with those satellites. Etc. So you have to convince the client by your professional introduction. And one of the most convincing way is you have designed part of the, the rocket by yourself. You know it well, and you know all the parameters. So then people will trust in what you said and initial and eventually trust in you and the product means the rocket. So that what had what I have deeply felt about the value of the reliability, the the reliable experience for um, a professional career in the project maker. Sounds like having a well-rounded background is really important and really valuable for your job. Um, Elizabeth yeah. has a question for you in the chat. Where in China yeah. do you launch from? Oh. Uh, they have four launching sites in China. Uh, one is in Xichang, and one is in Hainan, and one is in uh, Taiwan and Jiuquan. I don't know whether you know where, where are they. I mean, uh, three of them in the mainland, and uh, one is near the um, most uh, uh, south part of China. We have four launching sites. So I'm going to guess you probably didn't know you're going to be exactly in the position that you're in right now, because it sounds like you've had a lot of different experiences in your background. So what got you interested in space and how exactly did you get into the career and the, the field that you're in now? 
Mm, oh. mm, actually, it's um, mm, a quite accidental thing. Well, in 2017, I was still working in Asia Pacific, uh, Asia Pacific Space Cooperation Organization, which is also referred to as APSCO. It's an um, intergovernmental organization and provides a co cooperative mechanism for developing countries in the Asia Pacific region to unite and work for peaceful use of the space. Actually, I worked in EPSCO for about one year. It's not a very long working period for me, but it had great effect on my career and life. Um, and uh, later, I met the founder of Beijing Interstellar Glory Company at the end of 2017 by chance in a friend gathering. And he asked me if I am interested in the commercial uh, aerospace industry and uh, if I'm interested in the company that he just founded. Uh, at that time, the commercial aerospace industry has been well developed and grew very fast in the US. Uh, I can read lots of news from SpaceX, from Blue Origin, Rockets Lab, and OneLive and others, but it was a very, very early stage of commercial aerospace industry in China then. So I took it as a very good chance, and I think it's a Pretty cool for women, for lady that working in a private company that can make rockets in China. Uh, it was impossible in China in the past. I mean, before uh, before 2015, it was not a lot for the ordinary people that work in this area. So I answered the founder, oh yes, I'm interested, I mean. <laughs> so that's it. Back to today, I think I made an absolutely right decision. I love this job and uh, the company has been developed for pretty while. And Chris says accidents are great. And I totally agree with that. I think, I think that's a really amazing uh, story to be able to share. <laughs> Maybe you did, yeah, you did mention it was, uh, it was difficult or different being a woman um, entering this field. Do you want to talk a little bit more about what that experience was like for you? Some of the challenges that maybe you had? Uh, challenges? Uh, well, uh, as a woman uh, working in this area, you know, work with men and all of the, uh, most of the uh, people technical staff with mechanical, uh, mechanical background of males. <laughs> so when working with them, it means um, sometimes you look forward. Uh, both of the pressure from the work and also pressure from the family. Like I have a girl, uh, 12 years old, and I have spent much time with, with her. And also I have to balance my job and uh, my home. <laughs> uh, I think that this is the most challenge for me in life, actually. And also challenges in my career. Um, I would say it's not quite personal once about it. It's a great challenge to my company, you know. Uh, we have launched six rockets in the past five years, including two sending rockets, but the last three missions were failed, unfortunately. And that was severe blows to the companies as well as my own confidence. So there are so many reasons, factors, or maybe just, uh, just unlucky and for the failed missions. But the result is we failed three times. Um, it is the hard side uh, it is the hot side of a rocket maker. And uh, when the rocket stands, you know, at the launching, at the launching site, no one can guarantee its success. But generally speaking, the result is either 100% success or failed. For the rockets, there is no 50% score. And I was just standing on the launching, launching site. And for one mission, you know, I, when I saw the rocket broke up from the screen in the control hall, uh, it's like heartbreaking time. Uh, I got my tears there. And for the other, for the other launching site, uh, the rocket has flight to the last stage, uh, but the fairings failed to open due to a defective explosive bolt. Um, so the satellite was not released in that mission. And for that mission, the flight is supposed to fly uh, 550. Kilo, uh, kilometers high. It has, it has already reached, uh, I think, 510 uh, kilometers. It's just one step. Like I said, there is no, there is no 50 score. It's either you succeed, you succeed or you failed. So when you're standing in front of the screen, you see the control hall and you see everything there, sometimes I have to control myself <laughs> on this. Uh, that's 
there's a lot of challenges. And also after the failure, you have to come back. And as the vice president of the company, you have to uh, go back to review your team, your technology and all the papers, everything start again. Challenges everywhere. <laughs> And I think that's really important thinking about like pass fail. And I think, you know, not only within the aerospace community, but a lot of our students experience that. Can you talk about um, anything that you've learned from some of the failures? How do you fail forward? Um, yeah. Um, for the first thing, when you make a failure, you have to stick to your dream and stick to what you have uh, aimed for. Uh, it was a difficult time for everyone, like for in my company, but uh, um, as, a, as a staff in the company, stick to it and try to build confidence again. So everything has to start again. Uh, we can't stop, you know. Uh, from one hand, techni uh, technically speaking, um, from each design and from each details in the designing drawing papers, um, and also from quality control, assembly control, we have to go over and review the every step that we do from designing and to the real product, uh, sometimes double checked or triple checked and uh, more tests on the ground, like for our, uh, for our rockets, uh, rockets launching. Uh, we do a lot of tests, but uh, whenever the rocket standing on the launching site, you don't know what's gonna happen. So do, uh, as much as you can for the ground to cover all the air conditions, all the uh, all the flying conditions of the rocket before it's flying into the sky. And on the other hand, you know, it's a deal with people. Um, when we got the failure, we made the failure. I have to think, well, if there is anything wrong with the team, uh, is it because we have run too fast in the past few years of the company, uh, or is it because become we have achieved success and make ourselves over proud. So or is there anything that make us be going up? So lots of introspection from the part and uh, go over from your team everywhere and talk to them and rebuild confidence first. I have to be confident of the company of myself and then uh, talk to people and let them to know what make us failure and uh, what they think happen to us and what they can do and what I can do for them. And also we got recognize the team. Sometimes it happens, you know, when the failure come to a company, people may leave. So we organize the team. And also we form the company. Um, so start again, prepare for the worst, but hope for the best. That's awesome. And thank you for being so vulnerable. I know that can be really challenging in talking about failure, but I think it's a, something that we can definitely learn from. Um, Chris has a great question here. What advice would you give to girls or young people in general who want to be a part of, of the space economy and are facing challenges getting into there? Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I would say aerospace industry chain covers huge aspects of application uh, of, ap uh, of application uh, scenarios. So there must be one that you are good at it. So try to uh, find your own interest in of this whole area, like anything related to space company. Uh, from one hand, it means they go out of the space. And from other hand, it means anything related to the technology, space technology you use around yourself. Follow your heart and follow the riches. That's the main drive from your heart it can make you understand and learn much about this area and you're going to do good things with your own interest. I love that answer. Um, Elizabeth wants to know, you have a daughter, does she get to go to launches? And what's her experience if she does? And, and is she interested in space? Uh, I think she is, she, she, uh, absolutely. Because she always asks me, mom, <laughs> Is there ETs on the earth? Or sometimes he, she asks me, mom, <laughs> is there immortals on the earth? So uh, for her, when she look at the sky, you see sparkling, you see the stars sparkling there and she thinks so what is happening in there. So he, she's quite interested in anything related to space, especially um, I took her to the launching site 
and watch the launching process of my own, uh, my company's rocket. It, it makes her thrilled and she wants to know if she can get on board and maybe go out to the office, uh, to the space with the rockets. Mm. And also she's quite young, a good, a good time, a good period for me to ask her maybe go this way, maybe following my step or maybe to become an astronaut. She's quite interested in this. And whenever she saw some uh, launching news from the TV, she would ask, Ma, is that your rocket? <laughs> I like to answer questions to her like this. That must be a very proud moment. And hopefully we can get her connected with Space Prize when she's old enough. <laughs> <laughs> So I will, I will guide her there. <laughs> there you go. We love that. Um, Elizabeth and Tasha both have some really great questions. And I'm going to kind of ask both of them. And you might just be able to talk to both. And I can repeat the questions if you need to. Um, but the first question is, what precipitated the change in China to, to open up access to private space companies? And then the second question, what's the relationship between CNSA and the Chinese private space industry? How does each benefit from each other and how does it create um, healthy competitive competitiveness? Uh -huh. Can you repeat this question again? I'll make uh, some notes there. Sure. So the first one is talking about what precipitated the change in China to open up access to space um, at, to private companies. Okay. Uh, so you want me to add the first one, right? Okay. Um, I think uh, the space gym opened in 2015 in China. Um, honestly speaking, I think it's uh, the background, it's the whole uh, commercial space uh, chain that has been fast developed over the world, especially in the US. Like so many news from you know, SpaceX Rocket Lab. And uh, uh, for the state owned companies in China, uh, when they implement the, when they improve their launching of the, the, rocket, the rockets, the cost is quite high. But for uh, the private company like us, I think the government thinks they might have some cheaper and the best uh, better service uh, for their for their rockets launching. Um, quite similar, I think it's quite similar like the SpaceX, the SpaceX growing story that the company, the, the government needs some small companies to push the development of this technology and they want small competitors to their state owned companies so that they can um, push, the, push the whole area development. They got cheaper, they, they got cheaper, uh, cheaper products and they got better service. And also it's quite free uh, to talk or, or ask small companies to get involved in the, uh, international in the international commercial aerospace industry development. This is a, my point of view. Thank you. And Tasha, does that answer your question or did you want to reframe your question to get a little more information? No, that was great. Um, I like that you kind of compared it to the U.S. because it's kind of a similar thing going on with SpaceX in that they also develop the technology to go to space better. Awesome. Thank you. And Rebecca has somewhat of a related question to the US has largely failed in space diplomacy relations with China. How do the exclusionary laws that prohibit American space contractors from working with Chinese citizens and Chinese businesses affect your business and your morale? Mm. Uh, but actually, I can't really answer this question directly because it's not we can, what, what we as a private company can do. It's simply the, the policies that may be between the US government and the China the Chinese government. I can, what I can do is only following its rules. <laughs> and uh, for the effects, uh, you know, we can still do the, um, do the technical, to, to do the technical communications like in the international meetings, I have, I've been to IC meetings for two times, uh, not for this not for this year due to the coronavirus. But uh, in this in this uh, area, uh, we can still talk to each other. But so for the business collaborations, it's simply we can't. We have to follow the rules. 
So what is one thing that you would hope young people in the rest of the world would want to know about what it was like to grow up in China? Grow up in China? Hmm. You know, nowadays growing in China doesn't make a diff much difference uh, from growing, growing up in other like Asia countries because the internet is so developed. And it's easy to for people from different countries. They pop together. They share their they share their views and they share their stories. Uh, and from the education point of the view in China, I think when the children uh, go in China, everything's and um, when they were younger, I think everything has been fixed. It maybe compared to children. Uh, young students in European or US countries, um, they spend much time doing their schoolwork, might possibly, but it has been changed, you know, for some, especially for people, for students from big cities in China. They, they got more free, more free to choose what they want to do. Uh, maybe not only for the, the, work, uh, the schoolwork that has been designed, and they can choose something else. Mm, one uh, compared to experience when I was in UK, I think they are quite similar, not too much difference. China has quite open now, give, give people and young students more free time and uh, more free space to develop their own characters. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Chris has a great question about um, whether or not, do you, do you, are you aware of um, anything that China as a country or Beijing Interstellar is doing to support K-12 educators to implement space education? Um, I don't know much about this, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I, that's why we figure we we might ask that. Might be a place of of growth with both China and with your own company. Um, how many employees does your company employ, and what percentage are women? And do they have similar backgrounds and education, or similar career paths that you had? Thanks, Elizabeth. For the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we got uh, about four hundred staff in my company, and for the women, to uh, uh, small, <laughs> small percentage. I think it's uh, less than, uh, less than fifteen percent of it. Uh, not too many. Uh, you know, it depends on which department they're working in. If they work in the uh, marketing and also general affairs department, we got more percentage of women, but they were not, uh, they were not. Uh, based on the mechanical engineering background, but we also have very excellent uh, technical staff in the designing departments. Uh, they, quite, they, have, they have similar background with me, uh, like I mean, I major in mechanical engineering, but they might be major at anything like uh, uh, propellants or mechanical related, I think, yeah. They got, they got similar background with me. It's the, it's, it really depends what post they were doing. Wonderful, thank you. Um, how might we help prepare students for success in the growing space industry? And I'm gonna add a little um, addition to that. As someone who is now looking to hire new people to work for your company, what are some things that you would be looking for for incoming, you know, young new hires? What are some of the things that we should be doing to prepare them for the field of aerospace? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. Like if for, if for my company, if someone popped in that, well, very interested in the company, and I, when I was interviewing them, I asked, what makes you want to get into the company? And what does it mean? for the space for themselves. So first thing I would like to know if they are interested in the space and they are interested in the job they're doing. Uh, if they won't get well prepared uh, in this area, I'm still back to my own point. First, they, they should have the interest of what they are doing or what they are going to do. And they got a good score. That's the basic, uh, basic requirements. And for others, well, good communication skills, uh, like for the like for the rocket design, you have to talk to the people from different uh, sites, like 
some one may do the structured design and some one may do the uh, stress strain calculations. So a very good community skills. It's quite helpful for people when they were uh, for students when they were uh, when they were getting into their career. I think not only for the designing and for any kind of job, it's a good uh, skill that we do. For others, it's quite okay because uh, mm, the, the rock is designing or launching uh, sounds pretty cool, but still it's um, mm, it covers different aspects from different background. So just to do what you have done well today. That's, that's okay. So I'm gonna give you a very hypothetical question here, but I mm -hmm. want to know, what do you hope our multi-planet future looks like in 100 years from now? Ah, um, 100 years. So it's a long time for human being, but uh, uh, I mean, long time for myself, personal, but it's not a long time for the whole human being creatures. I think I would imagine that a hundred years later, the bridge that track, it's uh, fundamental. We can go to uh, some stars near us quite freely. And I think there might be newly defined a set. <laughs> you, on the earth, you may own something like, um, like, like your horse and like your boat and thing, but a uh, hundred years later, you might have the chance to own a small star far away that's named under your name and a newly defined social network and the relationship uh, because people will have a very new type of life. Uh, so the most, most uh, close people that connect to you may not be your family, it might be the people traveling with you together to go to the other side. So this new defined social network and relationship can give great, can affect great about the human human social life. And also, I would think uh, quite concomitant with AI robots, um, because for like a hundred years, I think for being maybe their life uh, is still a hundred years or might be a bit longer. So uh, when we do the Star Trek or traveling among the interstellar, so there might be a lot of work you'll do with the robots. <laughs> That's what's in my head. I love that perspective and it's not ever something I've, I've thought about, especially thinking about what your family and like who the people are that you're the closest to. That relationship part is so important. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have some educators that are on our call and that do listen to the show. What advice do you have for them as they're preparing these future generations that are going to be approaching this multi-planet future? What would you suggest that they should be teaching our, our, our future students? Teaching students, the first thing it's uh, get the students to accept a possible new type of survival mode. <laughs> That's the most thing, the most important thing to be prepared in the future because the future is different from today. And I think it, it also might be better for the students themselves to define or create their multi planet future themselves. Because um, we're talking about the future might be 100, maybe 200 years later. Uh, this picture, this future picture, it's totally different to different students. Everyone has their own aspects of the future. So let them to think themselves and the driven, for, the driven force will push them to be well prepared, which they want to be. It's a quite open question. It's simply because their future is different from mine. They will know what they want or what they want to be and what they want to be good at to, pre to be prepared for their own future. So my point of view is just to guide the students to the future they want. I like that answer. And, and kind of building off of that, um, Elizabeth was specifically asking, do you have any advice um, for, for students from different countries that might be um, collaborating on like a lunar surface together specifically. Do you have any uh, additional advice for how they might work together, um, especially people from different countries and different places that might need to be collaborating? Um, 
I think it's a good chance for us to talk this on this platform. It has been connected to myself, uh, connecting myself to all of you. And it's also, I think, for the country, for the for students from two countries, what they of course want to do is to be linked, linked to the world and linked to the people from different background aspects and from different countries. They need to find a way to link themselves. Internet is a good way, meeting is a good way, making friends with them is a good way, and maybe apply for the space prize is a good way. <laughs> so just uh, trying to find themselves, find ways to be linked in to be linked with different organizations. Um, I think when I was young, I learned a lot when I was traveling because I met different people in the world, and also. And uh, I learned a lot from the book, but nowadays people learn from the internet. So it's much easier for them to get things, to get people, get different uh, aspects, get their stories on the internet. Uh, it's a challenge because something is good internet, something is real and something is fake. <laughs> they, has, they, have to, they have to learn how to tell what is right, what is wrong, what is real and fake. But still it's the most efficient way to be linked for the internet. That's a great answer. Um, and Tasha, thank you for your question. What are the science objectives of the satellites that you launch from your company's rockets? I'm oh, sorry, can you, can you repeat again? Sure. What are the science objectives of the satellites that you launch from your company's rockets? Why are they going into space? OK. Um, uh, I can tell one of them because the other one has some, we have some confidential uh, contracts, I can't talk about it. Uh, from one satellite, when they were uh, delivered into space, they traveled around the, uh, the Earth for, for about a month. They took, they took pictures and they, uh, they also did some experiments to, uh, some experiments for their, I think, communications to the, to the Earth. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> for my point, for our for our point, how to deliver it to the right uh, orbit for the satellite, and later it flies itself. And what they are really done, the uh, the satellite company have all the information. They didn't really open it to us, <laughs> but I know they took a lot of pictures and they did some experiments there uh, about telecommunications there. Awesome! Thank you for sharing that. I just have one final question that I was going to ask, but if anyone else wants to um, to either unmute or write their questions in the chat, they're welcome to. Um, <laughs> the last question that I have that I'm interested to know, what is one piece of advice that you want to share with young people entering the space economy that you wish that you'd learned earlier in your life? Um, okay. If it's one piece or one word, I would say best to prepare for tomorrow is trying fast of what you are doing today. Everything you do today, it's useful. <laughs> That's very well said and very great advice for students. Are there any other questions from our audience that's listening in today? I was just wondering if she, she would tell us about the three-bodied problem book that I heard is very popular. I haven't read it and I heard it's going to be in a movie. It's called Three-Bodied Problem. Uh, yeah, I, I read that book. <laughs> is it good? Is it good? Should we read it? Yes, absolutely. I highly recommend it. I know that the writers in China, but I highly recommend the book. And also I recommend the book to my to my little girl. It's a bit early for her, about 11 years old, I think. But that book um, tells you, um, it's draw it's draw the picture of the, uh, the future of a human being. It's a different way of that. It also enlightened me and gave me a great idea of one possible uh, animal of the earth. <laughs> it's not a very good annual one, but I highly recommend so many series and so many possibilities there. Very normal, highly recommend, <laughs> very good book. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Um, and thank you so much, Yingxi, for sharing and for being so vulnerable on our, our talk tonight. I think you shared a lot about failure and how you can learn from that. Um, some of the challenges that you experienced as, as a woman being so high up in the 
um, in this field and, and also just about your experience growing up in China. So thank you so much for taking time to speak with us tonight. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark to close us out and see if he has anything else he wants to share. Oh, that's really fantastic. I love that it ends with a, uh, a Chinese science fiction recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> Probably time for me to read it too. I remember that book was on the, the top of uh, Barack Obama's book of the year list the year he read it too. So it's, uh, it's been on my radar for a while. I need to, I need to do it. Uh, no, thank you, uh, Jing Chi, for, for joining us. So fantastic to hear your perspective on all of these questions. And thank you to everyone who is here asking questions because that was just a great session so so many questions coming from uh, all the participants it was really fantastic uh and as always leslie thank you for being here to uh to moderate and lead the uh the interview just great to have you uh on board so we're uh we'll go ahead and wrap up the recording and uh, I, I will let you guys know when this this goes up on uh, on YouTube. And of course, we we hope to pull out some of these uh, some of these nuggets for Space Prize, um, and hope you guys will come back for future uh, episodes as well. I am also, as usual, happy to hang around for a few minutes. But I'll go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>